Hey, everybody, welcome to another episode of Dear Asian Americans. I am your host, Jerry Wan, and today class is in session. Uh, we're really lucky to have uh, Professor Julie Yeon Kim, uh, who is a professor and lecturer of Asian American Studies here in LA at Cal State Long Beach. Um, she's an artist, she is a singer, she's a community activist. Um, her works, written, vocal, um, academic, are really, really amazing. Um, I've been lucky enough to have known her for a really long time and really also lucky to see her um, grow and evolve um, as an activist with her voice and really somebody who speaks uh, her mind and her real passions about her identity. Um, so today we want to talk to her about you know her background. We'll meet her and learn from her, um, her experience uh, teaching Asian American studies at a university in an area that is predominantly Asian American and how her, her own identity has played into that. And then we'll talk a little bit about um, what she's going through now. Um, how do you teach a class about Asian Americans in the face of COVID-19, in the face of the things that we are dealing with as a community with particular focus on how the hell do we deal with all this racism and how do we internalize all that stuff? So um, Julie, thank you for making time uh, to join us on the show today. Yeah, thank you for having me. Uh, share, us, share with us a little bit more about you in your own words. Okay, yeah, so I mean, you said a ton. <laughs> um, my name is Julie Yeun Kim. I was born in South Korea came to the States when I was about four uh, with my family, and I've been living in Los Angeles ever since. Um, I had a kind of long journey trying to figure out what it meant to be a Korean person in America, especially having lived a number of those years as an undocumented immigrant. Um, and I found a lot of power, I found voice or the, the ability to use my voice through academia, um, but also more literally in singing and in speaking. Um, and lately I've been finding a lot of resources or just a lot of potential in, I guess, paying it forward, working with the newer generation. Um, I'm only a few years older than my students, but it's been great getting to know them, giving them the tools to understand what it means to be Asian in America, right? So, yeah. So take me back to, or I guess walk me through your, your thought process of choosing uh, graduate level work as a profession and as a path, and in particular, what drove you to study Asian American studies as your expertise? Right. So it's, you know, it was, I had a really long winded relationship. I didn't do so well K through 12. Um, there were classes where I really excelled and then classes where I just never even went. And then ultimately, um, I ended up by graduation time for high school, I was a few credits short. So I was actually like a high school dropout. Um, and so education and I had a really rough go <laughs> in the beginning. And as I got older, I found um, my stories, I think, stories that resembled mine, characters that looked and sounded like me in books. And so that uh, kind of gave me the, the kind of motivation to go back to school, a little older than most freshmen, I guess. Um, and then I got a bachelor's in English and I got a master's, another master's in English. But by the time I was in my master's, I had been fully just soaked into the world of Asian American literature, Asian American poetry, uh, fiction and memoirs and um, history also and, you know, films. And so that's where through English, I found Asian American studies. And that was what allowed me to kind of transition into the position that I have now. Very cool. And and also in, in light of you, you teaching Asian American studies, um, I think as an Asian American, obviously myself, um, you know, I didn't necessarily gravitate towards those classes in college. You know, um, I, I was a little bit more of, you know, the, the quintessential business major that thought about, you know, short term benefits and, and what do I need to learn to get the job? And, right. you know, and then obviously we have our, um, extremely stereotypical friends, you know, doctor, lawyer, engineer, straight to law school, <laughs> straight to grad school, all those friends. So, so I, I think in the grand scheme of things, um, I, I find extreme curiosity in students, uh, regardless of where they go to school, um, who either choose Asian American studies or ethnic studies in more broad terms as their major or even just to take a couple classes. So, um, you know, share with us a little bit about your experience teaching that. Are they all Asian American looking for identity or do you see you know, folks from different walks of life wanting to learn a little bit more about our unique history. 
Oh, that's a really good question. Um, most of my students are, I have a couple different classes and in some, most of my students, about 90% are Asian American. Um, and then I'll have uh, a few students who are white, who are Latinx, um, who are black, um, but again, mostly Asian American. And then there's another class where um, they're, a lot of times they're not Asian American. Um, so the, the biggest class that I teach, not the biggest, but I guess the, the main class that I teach is Asian American Studies 100. And that's actually uh, the freshman composition class. So if you remember, you went to USC, uh, you have two required writing classes, mm -hmm. one in freshman year, one in junior year. So that's a, well, USC requires two. My school requires one, but you can take that one class through an ethnic studies uh, department. So I think that's great foresight on part of Cal State Long Beach's uh, curriculum, I guess, engineers. Um, so a lot of my students who need to take English 100 have the option to take it in Asian American Studies 100. Um, and so instead of taking the English class, I'll take mine. And they come in just kind of like, well, I'm um, Asian American. This might be easier because I already know some stuff. And they quickly realize, no, that is not the case. Um, and there's also a running stereotype uh, among, I think, counselors in my school quite possibly, I'm not sure. They think that because a lot of the students who are Asian American were taking it, are engineers, we make this class easier. Um, maybe that was the case, definitely not the case in my class. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I hold them to high standards. And yeah, so I have a lot of students coming in saying, oh, I'm interested because you know I'm Asian American. I don't know anything about this. Um, my counselors recommended it to me. They said it might be easier. And my first couple weeks is about destroying that. <laughs> Very cool. Getting them to see what else is there. And so what is important to you in teaching in an introductory sort of a very broad term class um, context? We have a podcast here called The Asian Americans, fully recognizing and aware that we are not a monolith and there are enough stories within each country, which culture, each language to have its own show, multiple shows. Um, but we're trying to do a little bit of, you know, very many things so that everybody um, feels like their stories are being heard and told um, in, a, in a more formal structure, like a semester's worth of classes. You have to make some tough decisions on what to teach and what to bring up. And it is not a Asian history class. It is an Asian American class. So um, what, what are you, where do you find your inspiration and, and how do you decide what gets to be in the uh, syllabus or not? I'm not going to lie. A big part of it is trying to keep it. Uh, low turnover rates. <laughs> I'm trying to get students in my class and teach my material in a way and teach material, um, select material in a way that will make sure that they'll stay hungry for that knowledge. Mm -hmm. So I do have to negotiate, hey, this is really important, but this is really relatable and fun. Um, but in ethnic studies and Asian American studies, that's really possible because you're learning about things that are so real, that are so political and social and historical, anthropological, but at the same time, it's something that we wear on our bodies, right? So I'm looking for something that is important to the, the field of Asian American studies, um, but also something that is highly relevant to the students. Um, so I try to stay away from too much history. Uh, I keep the very basic rudimentary history starting from about the 1800s, right, 1880s. Um, and we have to do kind of a lot up to this point. <laughs> but yeah, so, the bare minimum, the bare skeleton of history, but also the, the skeleton of literature and the uh, sociology, critical sociology. So I'm taking a sampling of a lot of stuff, which makes designing the curriculum kind of impossible. I, I can imagine there's, there's a lot to cover. Um, what are some of the conversations that you have with students outside of the classroom when they visit you during office hours? And um, maybe a cool story or two about somebody's, you know, identity evolution while they're in class with you or, you know, beyond that. Yeah, so I have mostly freshmen, meaning they're not used to coming to office hours yet. <laughs> <laughs> so I've only had um, a few students who will voluntarily come, but that's why I make mandatory visits, <laughs> conferences, <laughs> and I think they will thank me for that. I think they do. Actually, in the evaluations, they say it's one of their favorite things. Uh, they just need that push. You know, they're 18 a lot of times. So I one that was really memorable for me was towards the end of the semester, I had a student who was Cambodian-American. Um, and he wanted to write his paper. The final unit in my class is uh, 
a individualized research. They, they create a research proposal, they find a topic, write a proposal and use that as a prompt. They do their own research and then they write this thing. Uh, one student wanted to look at intergenerational trauma of the Khmer Rouge between his parents and how that's linked to his own life. And I, I was just so moved because there's so much heart behind this, you know, and that's the benefit of having a class that is so relevant. Um, he wanted to talk about how the trauma of his parents was very real, even in his life, though he was born in Long Beach, let's say. Um, and how that trauma that created this new world for his parents and moved them across the world is now also shaping his life too. And he wanted to talk about gratitude. And I just, uh, yeah, that, those are the kinds of conversations that I live for. Um, I had a similar conversation with a Vietnamese American student um, who, you know, Cambodia and Vietnam, we're, these are refugees, right? Most of their uh, diaspora in the States is formed around the refugee experience. And so I found their stories really to hit home for me. Uh, they internalize it. They really just soak it up, you know? So yeah, there was another student talking about a lack of language between his himself and um, his parents and some of the dynamics that, well, some of the family dynamics that arise out, out of this lack of language. And that's something I think both are actually things that Korean Americans can understand too. Um, well, in my case, yeah. So that's why there's a solidarity there for me. You know, I thank you for bringing those up. I think, you know, most, uh, not most, many East Asian immigrants to America um, did it by choice, um, did it as a way to find a new place where they can have new opportunities. And we often forget, um, you know, not everybody is here by choice, whether right. it was through um, post-war refugee programs or transnational adoption programs. Um, there are many, many of us who look like me and you um, who have a very different um, origin story of how they became Dash American. And that really informs how they view the world. Um, you know, there might be confusion, anger, um, or even just longing to go back home because their entire you know family generation being here it is not necessarily up, up to them um you know if, if there are if you're an 18 year old college student or a high school student about to graduate um and you're looking at all the classes to take um you know take it from the 36 year old guy who didn't take any asian american studies classes um you know half a lifetime ago um do it i, I think you will learn a lot more about yourself um there are things that you know have become crystal clear to me about my identity and why it's important. Uh, you know, we don't have to live in the binary of, you know, being Korean or Asian with our Korean and Asian friends and acting like, you know, um, whatever else is the opposite of that when you're with your other friends. Um, I, I think it's important to understand how we form identity and, and community-based identity going forward. Um, and, and here's the things that are available to you today that were not available to me um, 18 years ago you have the next generation, my generation and beyond, like Julie, who is your professor? People who've been in your shoes. Um, a lot of the mentors or role models or people who spoke to us when I was in school, we did not have similar experiences. They were you know, newer or fresher, or, or I guess you know, um, on the immigration curve, right? So um, their experience of having grown up here and you know, some of the um, discrimination, racism, identity challenges that we Based that I faced, um, I don't think resonated as much. Um, for the young, you know, uh, listeners out there, you have the great benefit of you know twenty years of generation of people who went through what you're going through now. You might think that you're the only, or that you're the first generation to go through it. But look, uh, now you got you know Professor Kim and uh, you know me and other people who are sharing our stories with the hopes that you know you never have to feel alone in that. Um, so I highly, highly encourage you to do that. Um, and if you're at home uh, now, whether you're, you know, have vacated school or, you know, looking forward to graduation, so you're not really paying attention to class, you know, look up lectures, uh, read some books. Um, really, if you are especially moving away from home to go to college, I think it's more important than ever to have a very positive and strong sense of identity of who you are, um, and more importantly, who you don't want to be. Um, before you go into 
uh, college or the real world. Um, so Julie, I, I want to ask you about your class um, in light of the current uh, COVID-19 epidemic. Um, you wrote an amazing piece on your website and a blog that was shared widely. Um, it's being an Asian American uh, during COVID-19. It talks about um, interge intergenerational issues. It talks about the racism. It talks about everything that everybody else has to go through and then the extra stuff. Um, your world has changed because you know classes were all moved online. Um, we've heard that many, many times. Um, you know, from what I understand, Cal State Long Beach does not have a, a very large on-campus, you know, uh, residential population. So the shift perhaps not as uh, sudden or as drastic as, as some of our other our campuses, but still um, it's been disrupted. Um, so it, in addition to moving your classes to an online format and, you know, um, video chatting with your students or your colleagues, um, what other changes have you implemented in your curriculum or in your teaching style? Yeah, so one of the biggest changes that I made, um, well, first, well, yeah. So one of the biggest changes that I made was actually redesign the, the final unit in my class. Like I said, uh, the final unit in one of my classes, so the major class that I teach, um, the students choose their own topic. And typically they choose um, Asian Americans in media, Asian Americans in family, Asian Americans in trauma, like I said. Um, and this time around, it, it kind of didn't make sense for me to have such a large sampling of topics, especially because I can't, I'm not there to monitor all these conversations. So I thought it'd be better to centralize the, the conversations and what they're learning. So I just made my third uh, unit about COVID-19. Uh, there was also the sense of responsibility growing in me through be even before the lockdown happened that these students need to know what's going on, but there's also, you know, just as global citizens, right? But also as Asian Americans in the class where my, most of my students are Asian American, I felt the responsibility to talk about it from that perspective um, in the way that our parents are responsible in teaching us about a world of race and how to be Asian, right? Um, Asians in America, et cetera, or, you know, children of immigrants. So I kind of took on that parental responsibility. I said, you need to know what's going on. Um, and then I realized after having conversations that were really fruitful in class, because my students are, yeah, they're freshmen, right? And yeah, they're freshmen, but they're really bright students. Uh, they, they know what's going on. Um, and because these are lived experiences, they, they're speaking from multiple registers. They're not just speaking from a mental register, they're speaking from an emotional register as well, a historical register. They're bringing a lot to the table. But I wanted to be able to match that emotional knowledge, that emotional intelligence, um, that intuition with now facts, right? Because that's really when power comes together. Uh, so I, I spent our school, um, cancel classes fully for about a week and a half and during that week yeah right before we even went fully online and started having classes online it was canceled and I took that time to just scavenge the entire internet <laughs> find the most credible sources um, and compile this new unit to get them to understand number one where does this come from is this about Chinese people being dirty right is this about Asian people being diseased actually um, is this thing new, right? Is racism against Asian Americans new? How are we experiencing COVID-19 and the realities of it as a community, not as individuals? And how are we experiencing a backlash from history in the present? Uh, so all of these conversations I thought were necessary to equip my students. Um, Cause I want, I'm not gonna lie. I want my students to walk into a room and be like the wokest kids there, you know? Um, <laughs> that's just me and my heart as a teacher. So I, I put together three different parts. Um, what are, what's going on? So context wise, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I'm looking at the World Health Organization. I'm looking at videos about uh, the black market, the wildlife black market in China. I'm looking at what it means to flatten the curve, right? If we're not so scared of coronavirus, then why are we all staying home? These are questions that 18 year olds are gonna have. Um, and also 19 year olds, some of my students want me to say <laughs> they're 18 <laughs> as well. Um, so that's the first part. Then we're going 
and we're looking at the history again we're relating that to the history of asian americans because this is not new this is the same stuff being recycled against asian americans we've seen it in the past we've also seen it against brown Asian Americans. We've seen it against Latinx people as well. Um, constantly it's being redeployed. So we're looking at that history of race and racism. And then we're finally looking at what Asian Americans are saying, because we don't want to represent Asian Americans as being a voiceless people. That's just not the case. Look at you and me, right? Uh, and then, so, um, I probably don't want to say what the essay prompt is yet <laughs> because <laughs> we have to write about that and I don't want anyone to get a head start too soon. Yeah, so, and then it's culminating in a kind of research paper on the topic. Um, and they are again, redis, well, that's all I'll say for now. <laughs> and how has the student response been to the change in curriculum to current events? Well, you know, we're just getting started um, and I don't get to see their faces. Uh, I want to assume that the couple emails that I've gotten back so far are representative of the larger body and larger voice. Uh, I think they see it as being work that doesn't really feel like work. So that, and that's really what school is supposed to be in my opinion, if, especially if you're in the humanities and you're in the social sciences, you should be learning in a way where learning is disguised as well, you should be being educated, right? And studying in a way where it feels like you're just being a human, right? And I have to say thank you because you shared with me a couple of weeks ago that uh, my conversation with Dr. Paul Song from two weeks ago, you asked all your students to watch. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I exchanged some texts with Dr. Song about that. And it's, you know, it really validates and, you know, makes whole or makes sense of the work that, um, we do um, to share out those things because, you know, these are like, you're right, this, it's not new, you know, intergenerational conflict isn't new. Racism is not new. Um, you know, us being um, political bait to achieve some sort of different agenda is not new. Mm -hmm. um, you know, bundling together different colors of the spectrum to say you guys are all bad is not new. And unfortunately, um, you know, we, we can do something about it. Um, it may not be the last time either, right? So I, I think, you know, having these continued conversations, um, asking friends to reconsider some statements or some things that they may consider funny or, you know, non-racist, non when in fact, um, it's far beyond that. And as you mentioned, uh, different groups of people go through this, you know, time and time, and time again. So I, I think, more important to equip equip our students um, before they enter the world and before they have uh, some experiences that they shouldn't have uh, to really equip them with, like you said, be the wokest kids in the room to 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 say the right things, in, you know, in in a equally logical yet emotional way, so that we can you know hopefully change some minds and then to educate and to empathize with the people around us. Um, from your perspective of where you sit. Um, from a professor's chair, um, what are you excited for as we come out of this thing? And what are some things that give you pause? That's a big question. So one of the things that I am excited about, if I were to see, you know, if I look for a silver lining, um, it would be that Asian American studies has now again become visceral. Um, this is very similar to the beginnings of Asian American studies, which was actually this year, we just passed the 50 year anniversary mm -hmm. of Asian American studies being born, right? Out of uh, self-determination, out of social justice, uh, to stop wars in Southeast Asia, right? To demand um, fair housing, you know, things like that. Um, and even just the, birth of the, age, the, the identity, Asian American, because that was not a term that was widely circulating before 1968. So this is new. Um, that coming to consciousness was something that we saw in the very beginning, right? And I think we have some of the things in play that will give us this new revival in understanding what being Asian American means, where it comes from, what's at stake, and what we can do. Uh, so 
Asian American studies for a while was kind of, I don't want to say it was in the ivory towers because it's nothing like, you know, not to knock on anybody, but it's not like philosophy, let's say, um, where people are really just in their ivory towers, you know, talking about things. But Asian American studies was supposed to be on the ground, right? It was supposed to be accessible. It's supposed to be visible. And now we're getting back to that. I think, no, I don't want to say we're getting back to that, but I do, I think there is this revival of that um, accessibility. So that's something that I'm excited about. I'm also very excited about this, uh, an opportunity to strengthen interracial uh, relationships. Um, I've been pretty disappointed, I'm not gonna lie, um, with Asian Americans in the past, not as a whole, obviously, but with some Asian Americans who like to think of themselves as separate from this larger conversation of race and racism. And the thing is, it's, there's a little bit of us maybe Asian Americans excluding ourselves, but there's also a longer history of us being excluded from the conversation. There are other people of color who deny Asian Americans um, the right to even call ourselves people of color, which is very frustrating for me. But it goes both ways, right? Um, and when things have happened in the past towards, let's say, South Asians, when things have happened, especially with um, the reinvigorated anti-Mexican rhetoric of the of 2016, let's say, um, there were a lot of Asian Americans who did not stand up for these people who we share space with, right? I come from a town where actually most of the people who live around me were are Spanish speaking. They're brown people, they're Mexican, they're Salvadorans, they're Guatemalans, right? They're Nicaraguans. And so I, I've constantly been disappointed in seeing Asian Americans who will not say a word when these things are being deployed, these kinds of comments are being deployed against um, brown people, or when black bodies are being shot in the streets and Asian Americans did not stand up for that. I was disappointed, but then again, I understood because we've also had our experiences of tension with them where we've had our bodies hurt by them too. I get that. Um, but you know, a lot of Asian Americans now, I think will agree, one of the, one of the most irritating things right now in the news is for me is when other people of color will say Asians deserve that they're so racist like they deserve that we I see that a lot and that drives me crazy obviously but one of my favorite things to see one of the things that makes it all worth it is when I see black and brown people and even white people say this is not right we need to stand up for Asian Americans and we need to stand up for our neighbors. We need to stand up for people in our churches, in our schools, um, sometimes people who have married into the family. And that is what gives me hope. <laughs> that gives me so much hope. And I think it's a two way street. In the same way that I love seeing that, Asian Americans, we got to be those people too. We got to be the people who say, who will stand up um, for violence against other people, other people of color. Um, and I think that's a lesson that I really want. Number one, my students, they, that's a lesson they will definitely learn. <laughs> it's a lesson that I annoyingly tell all my friends um, and now a lesson that I wish we can all share as well. It's understandable from the perspective that given that our immigrant history is new, we are one generation from war for many of us our parents' mantra was survival, right? Yeah. Um, you know, if for folks listening, ask your parents what they majored in college because it's not running a store, right? It's not <laughs> doing what they're doing now. They had dreams, they had hopes, but they did what they needed to do. Yeah. So you could have the privilege to listen to this and to watch this and to, you know, have a job from which you can work from home. Um, but so when you put those things into the context of survival and nothing else matters, it is completely understandable and almost expected that you get into this bunker mentality of us against everybody. And so it is an evolution. Um, I think, you know, when we peel back all the layers, whether we are born with our layers of identity or we make them on our own, we're, we're human beings. And I think it is going to take time. I hope events like this, as unfortunate as it is, you know, helps to bring out the humanity in all of us. Um, one of the things that brings me a lot of optimism too is, um, our collective voice as Asian Americans becoming stronger together. Um, I'm seeing a lot of brothers and sisters out there who are, you know, uh, who used to identify, and we still can, um, you know, Korean first, Asian second, 
And it's like, yeah, that's cool. But, you know, if the racist doesn't care what you actually are, you, you have to you have to huddle together and say, this is not OK for all of us. Right. Um, when somebody says, hey, you know, person from China, you brought the virus and you go, no, I'm from Korea. Like that doesn't solve anything. It's still there. You just have to say that's racist, period, regardless of, you know, where I'm actually from or what I'm not. So I, I completely agree. I, I think Asian American studies um, should be requisite studying for anybody growing up in this country, because if you haven't faced racism blatantly or subtle, whether it is in the workplace or at school or just in the streets, um, consider yourself lucky, but be prepared to deal with that in, in a positive and uplifting way. Um, protect yourself, of course, but you know, um, in conversational settings, be prepared to have that dialogue of why some things are not right and then why um, you view certain things. Um, I, I think it's more important than ever. Um, and, and so, you know, to the friends who are listening um, that don't look like me and you, um, thank you for standing up for us, whether it is, you know, in your Facebook comment threads, which happens a lot, which are, you know, wherever it may happen, um, you know, humanity is is the thing that ties us together. And, you know, this is not a tit for tat. This is not a you march with me, therefore I will stand up for you. You do what's right because you're a human being and you have to trust in the universe and the humanity of your people that if, and sadly it is when, the next group of people get attacked for some stupid reason that we're going to be there as well. So um, this is this feels like class, Julie. This has uh, been educational for me and it's been refreshing for me to talk about some things that um, I never got a chance to learn formally. And, um, you know, there's so many more books out there. There's so many different uh, mediums, articles, uh, even podcasts and, and talk shows that really make it cool to be an Asian American and even more acceptable to talk about things um, you know, even, I don't know, we didn't even talk about it, but like mental health within the Asian American community is probably another like eight hour show that we can do. Right. Um, and so, um, but I, I want to end the show on this, which is the way that we end all of our shows, uh, goes back to the name of our show, the Asian Americans, which is a, a love letter to us from us, um, celebration, support and inspiration, uh, within our community. And so, um, if you would, uh, say something to us, maybe a younger version of Julie or somebody in your class, uh, you know, help us finish up the show. Uh, okay, so I'm going to read off something that I've written. All right, well, um, considering the fact that a lot of, my, most of my audience has been younger folks, um, this is directed towards people that I would consider younger. <laughs> okay, here we go. Dear Asian American, if you find yourself drained by what's going on, you find yourself terrified or even numb about what's going on. Um, I'm here to say I'm right there with you. If you've experienced people telling you you're overreacting and if they're gaslighting your experiences saying I've been through worse or it's really not that bad, I'm here to say you aren't overreacting and your concerns and your experiences are valid. Asian Americans were born out of a struggle for justice and equality and love love for ourselves, love for our families and our communities, but also love for this country and the world. So that's exactly what we're going to continue doing through this COVID-19 season. If you're tired, if you're scared, if you're confused, and if you feel like you don't have the right things to say to join this fight just now, don't worry. People like me and people like Jerry have got you covered for now. And we can only hope that you'll join us when you are ready that you'll pay it forward for the next generation. Beautiful. So really love Julie. <laughs> oh, sorry. I didn't mean to cut you off, but thank that was beautiful. Um, ever so eloquent um, in your writing. Um, so you've heard Julie speak with me or share a discussion with me for the last 30, 40 minutes. Um, if you want to see or if you want to hear her angelic musical voice, I urge you to go onto YouTube and search uh, Julie. I will leave all the links in the podcast notes or down below on Facebook, Instagram, or wherever you may be listening to this. Um, please take 10 minutes today to read her blog post. It's important. Um, it touches on logic and empathy, and I think it delivers in a way that um, brings a lot of comfort and peace to whoever may be reading it. Um, 
it's a tough time for everybody. Um, by the time this episode airs, you might be in week two, three, or four of uh, not having lived a normal life. Um, mm. You may be frustrated with children at home. You may be frustrated with parents at home. Um, but, you know, this is a time uh, that we have to make the best of it to really think about what, we're, what are we going to learn from this and how are we going to, you know, rise from it. Um, stay the hell home, do some reading, you know, get, get, get your boredom out of the way and watch some Netflix. Um, but after you get bored of watching, you know, your, your 10th show, um, read a little bit about Asian American history, uh, pick up a textbook, um, read a blog post or, you know, be bold, um, reach out to professors like Julie on the internet and say, Hey, I really need to talk to you about something. Um, there are countless of people who are here to help you. We are going to get through this together. And I'm not just talking about this COVID-19 pandemic. This thing called Asian American identity is a journey that there's really no end, no beginning. And the more of us that can join in, in support of each other, um, the better and positive and more enlightened experiences we're going to have. So, um, Julie, thank you so much for what you do. I, I find it amazing. Um, you know, from a guy that now has a podcast that shares our stories. When I was in college, that that was not something that I, sure, I associated with, you know, the identity from a social perspective. But, you know, um, could I make a business out of it? Could I make a career out of it? Um, these are things that were not allowed, right? Um, our parents told us to go do money making opportunities and money making things. And, you know, I thought it was weird. Why would somebody go and study and then now teach Asian American studies? Like it's just <laughs> you, um, you know, obviously I, my mindset and my thinking on that has evolved quite a bit. Um, you got, you guys do super important work. I hope that this experience spikes interest in what you share and what you uh, teach. And so I, I, I thank you from the bottom of my heart. Um, I, I look forward to your classes being in session. Um, so we can go in person and drop some knowledge on some students at Cal State Long Beach. Yeah, um, yeah, and you know, and and I will say one more thing to a lot of people out there: if this story resonates with you, and you think, "Heck, I wish I took my Asian American Studies class," call your local school, find out who the professor is. When all this stuff gets behind us in the fall, in the spring, reach out and say, "Hey, can I come and listen in on your class?" Mm -hmm. And after that, can I come and share a little bit of my story with that class? you'd be surprised at the reaction, not only from the professor, but from the students, because it's about time that, you know, we learn our history from the people that have lived it. So um, that is a challenge to everybody who is listening. Um, however you can express yourself and to share gratitude and perspective, I think is so important. Um, Julie, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, continue to do the great work that you do. And, um, I don't know if your students say yes. I think I'd love to read some of the essays that, um, you know, they're going to write at the end of the semester. Um, I, I think it's going to be beautiful. So uh, thanks again and uh, be well and be healthy. Thank you, Jerry. It was such a great time. Um, yeah, thank you again. All right. Take care. Bye.